And that moment of, oh my goodness, what have I done and why am I here is really overwhelming. It's, it's the sense that this is not the right place and these are not the right people and I've got to figure out how to get out of this because I've made a mistake. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to, Allison, hi, good to see you. Um, it's always fun for me to look through Vlad. Hello. Look through and see everybody who's joining us and all the names I recognize. Lisa, hello. Um, I get very excited every week when I look at our registrants and I'm like, look at all the people that I know who are going to join us. So, um, Anthony, how are you, sir? I am well. How are you, more importantly? Good. I am doing great. You've been through some stuff, huh? I have. I have some pictures to show you of what's happened since the last time I talked to you. Um, but I was thinking about the last time we talked to you, we're stuck in a snowstorm. I was? Yeah. Remember you were driving over the mountain? Oh, that's right. Yeah, but New York. <laughs> it's New York. Listen, listen, it's New York. Like you guys aren't used to it, but there was a little, it was a little dangerous for us too. But yeah, we, that's right. I was over the mountain. I was in my car. Um, but now the weather's a little bit better. Matter of fact, in the background, you may he hear kids in the house next to me jumping on the trampoline. So the weather's better. Everybody has spring fever, right? It's like oh. time. They have, time travel to get fever. Out. they have go out and get the restaurants fever. I, I think we're going to have the best uh, year in some markets in the hotel business than we've ever had. Yeah. Well, I just bought plane tickets to come to New York City. Oh, I'm bringing wow. my daughter in the summer. Okay. So she's old enough now that I think she will enjoy all the things to do. How old is she? Um, she's nine. Okay. So, you know, when they're smaller, it's just like a lot of walking. Okay. But when they get a little bit older, I think. She's, where are we she's staying? Where are you staying? Um, I haven't decided where I'm staying yet. Okay. We but got I to bought, get to a good hotel. Go ahead. Yeah. I bought tickets on Southwest for like $50 one way. Yeah. So I'm ready to go. I'm okay. ready to go. Get out. Well, so. I, I'd be happy for New York. Thank you. And please let me know when you're coming in so I can maybe, I, I, some people like, you know, tour guiding. I, I will tour guide you if you want me to. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a kind offer. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's start with, we've got pictures and 20 questions. And then we're going to talk about sense of belonging today. So let's start with pictures. Please tell me who this is. That's Lily. That is my wife's best friend. And um, that, that's the per that's the thing that uh, <laughs> goes above everyone. Maybe she, her father is a close second. She's so pretty. Yeah. So how long have you had her? Um, she's going to be seven uh, on the 22nd of March. Oh, my wife reminds me every day. Yeah, that's a good age because they're past the like puppy mischief. And they're like well trained and just want to be around you. Right? My dog is completely not well trained in <laughs> any way, shape, or form. She's still a wee wee pad in the kitchen. I still walk over a fence. She still can't be in the yard by herself without trying to squeeze through the gate. Oh dear. Um, she is the, the the opposite of well trained. So she is um, a spoiled dog. She's a lap dog. Yeah, that's great. Well, we just got puppies. I think I told you that a couple months ago. These are my two puppies. Oh, look at that. Where, where um, are they? This is Ember on the left and Olive on the right. And they are still puppies and they still wake us up in the middle of the night. And it's a good thing my daughter loves them because she keeps telling me, remember you paid money for them. When I'm like, I'm going to kill them. She's like, <laughs> you paid money, mama. You know, don't just settle down. So, okay. Also, Anthony, there are a lot of pictures of you in trouble. Like, what is happening here? I am in Ireland. I am a, the most haunted castle in the world. And uh, that, is an, um, that is actually, I don't know if that's original, I don't know what that is. But basically, it's when Ireland uh, didn't get along with its neighbors. And there were a lot of people killed in that castle. So it's very haunted. Wow. And um, so my director thought I was getting out of line and he put me in there. <laughs> It's pretty uncomfortable. The socks are pretty uncomfortable, not made for comfort. Yeah, it was. Um, and then here's you in a lineup. I am in a prison, a haunted prison somewhere, I think in the States. And um, the reason I like that picture is because the measurement isn't correct. So it makes me look like I'm almost <laughs> six foot tall. 
And you what know you picked you, up on that. You know you picked up on that. <laughs> what do you have in your hand? What's that? What do you have in your hand? That is what the prisoners used to have to uh, walk around with. That is a ball and chain. Ooh, like a literal ball. Yeah, yeah. If you if you see um, extreme hotels, you would you would see uh, you would see the show, and uh, and I refrained from when I picked it up, refraining from oh, a ball and chain. I'm married. This makes sense, <laughs> but I didn't do that. All of a sudden, it makes total sense. That was probably wise of you. Good, good choice. Okay, and then one more. This is you incognito. I was in Myrtle Beach. It's so funny how I can immediately know exactly. I didn't remember every picture. I actually looked like my younger brother, Michael, there. Um, I was undercover. They wanted me to go undercover. I really didn't want to. They got a makeup artist with a bad mustache and hair. Um, and it was for a scene for us to check in with a group uh, that we booked. And basically, they're never prepared. We wanted to see if they would be prepared. And they did a pretty good job. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that's one of the only times I've ever gone undercover. I was going to say, I think I've seen this episode and I think I remember it like, oh, he's never done that before. So that's oh, a good one. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about uh, just a little bit before we went on air about what's happened in Texas since last time I saw you. So for those of you who don't know, we had a crazy winter storm. We had no power. Then we had no water because they decided that electricity to the water um, facilities, water treatment facilities was not super important. So they stopped, stopped sending electricity there. So my family had three days. I, I feel really fortunate. We had a wood stove. I have gas so I could still cook and everything. But since then, we have a house on the market and the electricity went off for a little while. And so it was 32 degrees in the house. The sinks, and the pipes all froze. Oh my God. I had to go. <laughs> I've had a rough time since I saw you last. I had to go to the house and cl and crawl under. This house is built in 1921. And the only water shut off is under the pier and beam. So I had to army crawl under the house after it's been leaking for a day and a half and shut off the water. So this is what I look like at the end of that. Oh, that's not bad. You still got a, kind of a half a smile on your face. Well, I was amused. I was like, I will never do this again. I was covered in was mud. It sewage or dirt? It was just mud. So oh. it was not sewage. So thank you. <laughs> and then the next day, the real estate agent called and said that our, our ceiling was leaking. So I went over to the house and I got up on the counter to try to figure out where the water was coming from. And I fell off the counter. Oh my God. And hit my head and busted my elbow. Oh my God. I didn't know that. And how high was it that you I fell? Mean, counter height. What's that? It was, it was counter, like, you know, waist oh, level. Oh my God. So <laughs> it was rough. I've had a rough time. Well, so I'm in that way. spirit, let me tell you what I've decided. I've decided that we got the calendar calculations wrong and that the new year actually starts tomorrow. Because I think it was like about a year ago when everything broke. So I think we're going to have like a New Year's party tomorrow. And we're going to be like, we're just going to say goodbye to the last 365 days. Well, what I've been saying is June 2021 is the beginning of the new year. So I agree with you. I'll, okay. So um, I think that that works. Like if it doesn't get better, if we celebrate tomorrow and it doesn't get better, then I can roll it forward. To well, you're seeing a difference. Great. I got vaccinated. My wife's vaccinated. So as people are getting vaccinated, you feel like things lifting. Yes. Exactly. We got vaccinated as well. And it's just, oh, I cried. I, I bawled when I got the second one, just so grateful. So yeah. I'm I have, from getting a second one. My wife got the second one, but um, I, I cannot wait. It's um, yeah. yeah, it's, we're very fortunate, but, but again, you already see people taking it for granted. You already see people like getting back to normal and forgetting. It's like, and I think what you were going to talk about today is about that. Yeah, for sure. So let's do 20 questions and then we'll dive into sense of belonging. Okay. okay. All right, go. here we go. What is your favorite fashion decade? Oh, that's a good question. 20s and 50s. Oh, that's good. When is the last time that you rode on the subway? Oh, five years ago. Really? Yeah. Do you like the subway? I love the subway. I just, I have a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you're like, unlike most people in New York, I can drive around. I, I live on the peninsula. So like it's, it's, it's getting to the city oh, by far. our plane is two hours. It's far. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you ever get recognized in public? All the time. Really? Yeah. And I don't even say like, like that. But yeah, of course. Are they like... Know. Are know. they subtle? Like they, you just like notice they're looking at you, or they come over. And it, 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 it runs the gamut. You have like you have fans. Like just the other day, I had a mask on, and this lady had a mask on, and she thought because we had mask on, we could hug and kiss. And <laughs> uh, so yeah, but every every when I travel, especially, I mean, all yeah, every day. Yeah. Um, sometimes a hundred times a day. Sometimes, you know, people. What, what what's really good is people, kind of ninety percent of the people just give you a thumbs up and like, Hey man, love your show. Quick picture. Um, 10% of the people get a little bit more intimate and talk to you and stuff, which is great. Um, but I stop for everyone, love everyone. But now that we're wearing a mask, obviously I can, I can kind of go in, you know, I was in, we, where was I? I was in California for business and um, um, we were in restaurants and I, you know, I was in a corner and I got noticed once or twice, but we're coming in and out. I didn't get noticed. For that that must be nice. Especially like we talked about last time you're an introvert. It must be really nice to be like, I can sometimes fly under the radar. Oh yeah. I, I have enough celebrity where it's fun. Any more celebrity is not fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. What are two things that you always have in your travel bag? <laughs> Hold on. From now you on. No, no, okay. This morning I nicked my ear. And my wife goes, hey, why don't you get the travel bag that your assistant put together for you? So, and I had the thing that stops the blood, thank God, right before my podcast. That's why I was a little late for my podcast. Oh. Um, so I always have that, but uh, cuticle oil and um, floss. I'm a big cuticle oil floss guy. <laughs> These are necessities when you're traveling. Okay. Who was your favorite superhero? Spider-Man. Okay. Do you have a traditional Sunday dinner? Like, yes. is there something? Three o'clock, meatballs and spaghetti or, or meatballs, pasta, uh, gravy, uh, Joey Zadori, if you're hearing this, which you're not, it's gravy. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Every Sunday, matter of fact, what's really been tragic is because of COVID, we can't have my father-in-law and the family over. Every Sunday, two o'clock, if you ever think of Anthony Mercury, we're sitting down having, we're, at, we're eating Sunday, two o'clock, every Sunday. Okay, what is your favorite number? 24. Oh, okay. What is one piece of advice you have for people when they're traveling? Deal with it. Just, <laughs> just deal with right? it. <laughs> Listen, Matt and I travel together all the time and we have basically the airport test is like when everything falls apart, can you spend time with this person and are they going to go to pieces or are they going to deal with it? Right. right. Because there's never, not going to be done. Honestly, honestly, I've had delays, not too many, but believe it or not, because I fly Delta. I love Delta. Um, but when I have delays, I deal with it. I build everything in. I'm not the rush guy to the airport. I build two hours in to all my travel. So yeah. I've had delays, but I still got there on time because I just I just build everything in. And I am, by myself, I am the chillest traveler in the world. I can get through you know a line at the airport in like three seconds, like a ninja. Yeah, um, but but I'm also chill when I travel. I go in the Delta Sky Lodge. They feed me. I drink, and I don't really drink, but um, I just yeah, it's, chill you just got to deal with it. Whatever happens, yeah. just deal with it. That's good advice. Did you play any sports? Yes. What did you play? Wrestled, baseball, oh. and really anything. But uh, but organ or from an organized uh, high school wrestling team and baseball. Okay, I did not know that. Um, what was the last thing that made you laugh? <laughs> My wife in the kitchen just about 10 minutes ago. I said something. I, I, I went to grab some tuna fish and I, we didn't have the tuna fish I like, so I ran out to the store to get some tuna fish. I'm making myself a sandwich. And I, uh, I said, oh, babe, I got you something. And I put um, a parking ticket on the counter. And she goes, oh, what'd you get me? And she goes, you, I would just say, she <laughs> used the F word, which she doesn't use very often. And then she used the word idiot. <laughs> I fell on the floor laughing. <laughs> All right. Um, if you could relive any age, what age would you choose? 27. Me too. Really? That is my favorite age. Really? Yeah. Why, well, why do you like that age? Uh, it's right. Um, how old I? Like right when I met my wife, when I started to realize I actually had an opinion 
that I, I, I was not as insecure and narcissistic as I was. Um, I started to feel safe. I started to feel, because I grew up in an environment that was like, you always you never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I, I think 27 was when I realized, oh, I'm a big boy. Yeah. <laughs> it is like the, the introduction of like real adulthood. And also you have your whole future ahead of you. So it's like yeah. you have the best of both worlds. Like you're still young, but there's right. a lot to, that's going to happen. Right. right. Like, like but if you ask me what age I feel, I feel 35. Because I felt like when I like when I fell or did sports at 35, I still look like agile. I posted something on Instagram this morning, and I don't know if you saw it, but it I did. Like, yeah, it looked like a 55 year old man <laughs> working out, and I was just like, "But you know, I'm not I'm not doing it for 55 uh, for 20 year olds. I'm doing it for inspire 55 year olds." <laughs> and you're not um, disagreeing with me, so I'm insulted. <laughs> <laughs> no, Anthony, don't be crazy. All right, um, what is something you wish you had enough money to do? nothing but money doesn't drive me so peace i just want peace and happiness and healthy and i, I don't think that way I, I i wouldn't know what to say i mean money just to make sure my kids 100 years after i pass away they have money for their kids but yeah um i'm driven by by other things so i couldn't answer that yeah that's why i like you all right what is the longest you've gone without sleep oh um Almost three days. Really? Yeah, I was a night manager in the city. And when you work nights and then, you know, I, I was getting married and like, you forget to sleep. And like, by the third day, I was like getting needles in my face. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I was starting to shake and I was like, oh, I haven't slept. Yeah. About three <laughs> days, about three days. But I don't sleep. I don't go to sleep till 2.30 anymore. I wouldn't go to sleep till 2.30 more. morning. I was up at seven o'clock. It's not because I'm working. I was just kind of relaxing. That must be so nice. <laughs> I, I really like sleeping and I try to do it as much as possible. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever been in a food fight? I've been in a rock fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> That's totally different. <laughs> That's like a fight fight. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> rock fight. <laughs> okay. How often do you people watch? Oh, constantly. You know this trouble I, I I should be in by husbands or or girlfriends or or wives. I look at children. I look at I, I am like it is my oh my god. I'm obsessed with people watching. That is my most favorite thing. I think it might come from being a New Yorker because it's like there's so many people and so many things to see, and a lot of them are very strange, right? Yeah, but I'm hyper visual. Like, like I, I've never used, I always say visual, but I'm hyper visual. Yeah. And like, as I'm realizing this project I'm working on, I am so visual. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's my wife, like, is like, dude, you, you're going to get, you're, you're going to get killed one day. <laughs> I'm like, like, stop looking. Like, it could be a guy. It's not like it, or a girl it could be like, I love like, how did their dress look? And how did his clothes look? And what watch? And why is he wearing that watch? And what kind of car? I walked into the grocery store to get the tuna for sandwich. And it was a Bentley SUV outside my uh, uh, outside the grocery store. And I yeah. live in a neighborhood where you, know, you have middle-class people, then you have people with SUV Bentleys. So, but you don't see them very often. Right. And I swear to God, there were 12 people in the store and I nailed the guy that had the SUV Bentley. That's a fun you, game. You, it, 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 I, I looked at his sneakers and I looked at his t-shirt <laughs> and I was like, that's the SUV Bentley guy. And I walked out purposely when he walked out and he got the SUV Bentley. So yeah, I'm hyper- <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you could give your younger self any piece of advice, what would it be? Don't ever give up. That's good advice. And we are, so one year ago, we said everything kind of started falling apart. How was your, how was your life different a year ago? Um, I, I mean, I, besides I, you I, didn't know me, so, um, you know. Yeah, and, and no, my life is much more rich. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You and the people I absolutely adore and love. Uh, Matt, not so much. And, um. <laughs> No, nothing. And um, yeah. how did different a year? Mm -hmm. um, I don't care anymore about things that maybe I cared about before. Um, I always been that my kids are happy, my wife's happy, my family's happy, I'm good, but it's like so much deeper. And I, I have a quicker, like I, I quoted, I, I don't have a short temper, I just have a quicker, I just have a quicker road to BS. Um, I might be, I, I have zero, zero, zero tolerance for BS. So I don't care. I don't care anymore. Yeah. Like, I don't care. I don't care about my, like, I, I'm going to have a career and I'm going to have 
you know, and hopefully make money and do whatever I have to do to support my family. But like, I just don't care of that nonsense anymore. And I will call you out quicker than I've ever called people out in my life. I just did it recently. And I just, I'm not mean, I don't scream and yell, but like, I just don't care about that. Yeah. I think there's something about just the preciousness of life when everything is wrecked that you're like, I just can't spend a single se- second in stupid stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just don't want to. Stupid know. people. I'll just say it. Stu- I just have no time for stupid people. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me, thank you. I always learn something. Oh, thank, what did you, what did you learn? You that I have well, I didn't, no, I didn't know. I didn't know that you played sports. I'm a big sports guy. Didn't you? I see mean, I know you like, like them, a, but I didn't know that you played them. Well, so played, I, matter of fact, the reason I'm like doing that agility exercise is because that's a winter of not like I work out, but it's not. I don't have a lot of you know. I, I'm not doing a lot of agility, so I was doing agility exercise this morning, and I wanted everybody to see where the 55 year old guy looks like trying to get back into uh, shape for softball. <laughs> so yeah, I play softball. I um, uh, listen. If there's a sport. I will play right now. I'll yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, I it has ski. been a year where everything has been closed, so I wouldn't know that you normally would be doing I, I that. I ski. So. I, you know, any, anything sports related, I will do. Okay. All right. So let's move on to State of the Union. I just have okay. two things to talk about in terms of State of the Union, and then we'll, we'll go to um, sense of belonging, and then I'm going to lead your master class today again. Um, So in terms of State of the Union, I don't know if you saw, so we passed this $1.9 trillion relief package. Of that package, $40 billion is approved for colleges and universities, and they have to use half of it on student emergency grants. Um, So that's really good. There's also some stuff in that bill that is going to, is like a precursor to if they ever decide to forgive student debt, they had to get a couple of things worked out before they could even attempt that that's in this bill. Wow. And then also, so is this good? Is this good? Um, I'm not sure how people feel about it yet. Mm-hmm. I don't know in the, in terms of the business of higher ed, I'm not sure what's going to shake out from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing that's in this package is fixing the 90, 10 rule, which is this rule that says schools have to make 10% of their revenue from a non-federal a federal source. So the federal government can't fund all of your revenue. You have to at least have 10% that's coming from a private source. Mm -hmm. And before this bill, they were not counting GI money. So money that's coming from the GI bill, they were not counting it as um, federal money. So for-profit schools really wanted veterans to enroll because not only was it federally backed with the GI Bill, but it it satisfied the 10% non-federal money, even though it was federal. So they've just changed that now to their counting GI Bill as federal money. So a lot of nonprofit schools, which we don't work with um, any of them, but they are very unhappy um, about that adjustment. So that will be really interesting to see how that shakes out. Just as a reminder, 40 billion in this bill, Last year in March, through the CARES Act, um, universities got 14 billion, and then 22.7 billion in December. So they are getting a lot of money that's coming in, and there's some of the um, kind of business practices that are being. Yeah, the school, the school that I sit on the board of, they they got several million dollars, and it was extraordinarily helpful. Yeah, and I think schools are doing such a great job of making sure that goes directly to students, and we are seeing a huge impact on students. Um, able to pay their bills or get grants and and that sort of thing. So I think that that's awesome. Also, um, I wanted to tell you that there was all of this um, guessing about how many schools were going to close. So I don't know if you remember us talking about this, like all these people are like, all these schools are going to close. It's going to be a disaster. In May, they they estimated a thousand schools were going to close. The actual number from March 2020 to January 2021 10 schools have closed. So it was not nearly as bad as everybody Thank predicted. God. And is that because of the federal government helping? Um, I think it's because ed- higher education is a very interesting business. So in the depression, everybody said all the schools were going to close. Only 2% of schools closed. People like higher education and they continue to go and they continue to support it. And I think federal money obviously helps. Well, and, 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 and psychologically, mm-hmm. like when you're feeling poor and you're feeling things going the wrong way, you maybe latch on to higher education as a way out of that. Feeling. Right. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So there's a lot of talk about how higher education is changing. People are cutting programs. Stanford cut 11 um, athletic programs. There's a lot of evolution that's going on in higher education, but it definitely has not been the same sort of everything is broken and we don't know what we're going to do that they predicted in March. So that's really good news. I feel really happy about that. Okay, so let's move on to the big concept of sense of belonging. And I wanted to say, Anthony, as you and I are talking about like things opening up and people getting vaccines and thinking about how we're going to evolve in the future, um, we actually, in our time together, I think are kind of evolving into, we're evolving away from what I've really felt like is crisis management, <clears throat> which is like, I get to spend time with our clients for an hour and they're in the middle of a crisis and I have to deliver for them like a fully formed one hour, here's what you should be doing. You gotta be talking about leadership. You've gotta be talking about community. You have to be doing this for your students. And I think we're moving into a more thoughtful and reflective time where we can say the crisis, although still with us, we're seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and we can start thinking about how we're gonna put things back together well and so this introduces our four part series on um, sense of belonging. You and I are gonna introduce it today. Next week, I am gonna have, I don't know if you know this, but I have, when I was working at a school, I had a student who adopted me. And this was like 15 years ago, maybe. So I have like a 28 year old daughter who uh, graduated. And you, a, and you have a 55 year old son. Yeah, right, right. I, I adopted you too. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so I have a 28 year old daughter who was a first generation student who graduated from school, got her nursing degree, now has a job in DC. And she was my crash course in how to work with students and talk about this equity gap that's happened. So she's going to join me next week when you have the week off. So I'm really excited about that. And then we'll talk about some of the research the week after that. And then we'll talk some about service. So this is really the beginning of the series of sense of belonging. Um, that we're gonna, gonna be talking about. And I want to just introduce it first as kind of a big concept. You saw up there that it said fiercely focused, which um, the, the Hotel Impossible we're gonna do, this is what you said to the woman. I'm not gonna tell you who it is yet. Okay. But it was such a good, like we need to get fiercely focused on how we are inspiring our students to have a sense of belonging on our campuses. And so I wanna introduce this idea of sense of belonging and then we will walk through um, some examples of that. So sense of belonging. Um, if you think about, this is where I lived in New York. I was gonna say uh, that, hold on, I'll tell you where that is. That is on the east side and that is second, third Avenue? That second is second, Avenue? this is taken from second Avenue. Okay. This is um is there a sign oh, oh you know what there's a sign right there so second avenue mm -hmm. so this big building on the left right there is the building that i lived in in fact i was on the 17th floor facing this direction so that's my window 240 good location good yeah location. 240 um 27th street and i came to school in abilene texas which looks like this uh-huh and my <laughs> sense of belonging was a little bit off so I want to talk about what sense of belonging feels like. And I think you have some examples of this in your own life, where when I get to college, um, I do not understand anything about the school that I'm going to. So it's a West Texas mentality. It's a very extroverted campus. So I have to go to Welcome Week and I'm looking around at these people who are enjoying things that I would never, like, I don't want to do anything that you're asking me to do. And I don't feel like I belong here. Um, the story that I've told you before about when I first came to Texas, I went to the grocery store and the woman said, how are you, honey? Which is what they do in Texas. How are you, honey? And I was like, I'm sorry, how's that your business? Like, why are you talking to me, right? And my friends are like, settle down, settle down. This is how, these are the rules here. Um, I- Why is that your business? Did, yeah, I did not understand why people were being- Friend, what I what I thought was fake friendly. I did not understand the rules of the campus. I was looking at the people on my hall and thinking, I have nothing in common with these students. And I have made a 
terrible mistake by coming here because I did not feel like I belonged at all. Um, is really overwhelming. It's, it's the sense that this is not the right place and these are not the right people. And I've got to figure out how to get out of this because I've made a mistake. And I think you you said that you had a similar thing when you went into the military. I went in the military in um, Whiteman Air Force Base, which is in Missouri, in the middle of the country. And it was a World War II base. So you had the heat pipes above ground. It was really depressing. And um, thank God the stealth bomber came. So we, we had a billion dollars and we had the best shower hall, best facilities, best dorm, best gym. And so things changed and it opened up and it felt better and all that but oh man there were months i remember calling my wife and was like man i'm glad there's no tall building so i jump off one of them yeah. um i was like i was so oh my god I was so out of sorts and believe me i wanted to get out of brooklyn so bad it wasn't funny not because i didn't like brooklyn just because of my circumstances um but it was really i felt same thing i didn't feel i didn't feel um part of it i didn't i felt i felt stupid i didn't feel like i belonged i i just it was a disaster and, but yeah. then and then it's not then right Right. That's right. So that, I mean, that's such an important part. Like if you stick it out, then it's not, if you have people who can help you through that. But I was talking to my colleagues at work and, and every single one of them have a sense of belonging story, right? Like I picked a school. So Matt was saying he picked ACU for all the right reasons. He actually would have really belonged well in the same environment where I was like, get me out of this. He would have fit in really well, except they put him on a floor with all athletes, all football players who are not the traditional um, campus community. And so he was like, wait, I do not belong here. I don't know why I'm on this hall with all of these people who don't have the same values or perspective or whatever's me and, and thought I should leave. I've made a terrible mistake. Um, so my, my, uh, Kendra, the girl that I'm going to interview next, next week, she would call me and she would say, I'm listening to the concerns that my peers have like, I don't have enough money to go out to eat for the sixth time this week, or I'm really stressed out because I want this bag and I can't afford it. Like she's listening to those things and she's thinking about the things that are happening in her life and her head and what she's anxious and worried about. And she's like, I do not belong with these people. I we're just too different. I don't know how to make sense of being on this campus when we're so completely different. And that narrative um, is a reason why people don't persist because if they can have an easy way out, they just look around and think, I don't know why I've done this. Right. A hundred percent. And you have to persist. You can't give up on yourself. That's right. I, I compared it with, I don't, I don't think I've told you this story before, but my maternal, no paternal grandmother, I didn't know her very well. She was from Alabama. So I'm from New York. She's from Alabama. I never really met her. I came to school here. I went to meet her for the first time when I was in college. And within two seconds, I was like, I know this woman, this woman, I come from this woman, the way she talks, the way she thinks about the world, the way she doesn't suffer fools, the way she has an opinion, like this person resonates with me. I had an instant sense of belonging versus these other people that I didn't know that then when I was around them, I was like, I do not understand who you are at all. Um, so it's a really interesting thing where you know you're in the right place with the right people or you don't know that. And how we help students get through that, I think, is so important. Yeah. And I think it's it's time, right? It's it's sometimes it's time. And then and, and it also takes time to realize, no, 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 I am in the wrong place because right. sometimes you are in the wrong place and yes. sometimes you do have to transfer. <laughs> that is true. And that is all about good fit, right? So sometimes we always talk about like the transition woes are always there. It's what happens when you move to a new place or you start a new thing. There's something really hard about making the transition. It's like, I don't know where the grocery store is. I don't know who my neighbors are. Transition is always really, really hard. And even if it's a good fit and you're going to end up loving it there, you're still going to have transitions. It's like the first day of vacation, right? You go into the resort and you're like, I don't know if this is the right thing. And then all of a sudden by the second day, you're like this is the best place ever. Yeah. I'm going to live here now. <laughs> it takes, right. It just takes your time to acclimate. Exactly. And so you want to be really careful with students that you're helping them understand the difference. You can be a good fit student. This can be the right place for you. It's just hard to transition or you actually, this is not a good fit for you because we're not doing enough to support you or because it's just 
we value these things and you value these things and you're not ever going to feel happy or successful here. So I think that's really insightful to be able to make a distinction between stick it out through the transition or this was not a good choice for you. You should find somebody, someplace that's going to really support you um, really well. So I think that sense of belonging lives in a couple of different places. I think we look for it in language. So how we talk to our students, how we explain to them our campus. I think it, it uh, lives in early experiences, how they have that transition and how they come as freshmen. Can I, can um, I talk to that for a second? Yeah, please. As a, as a father that's gone a lot of orientations, the person you put in front of those parents and those kids better be like, like, loving and dying for that university because we've walked out of universities and it's just that kid that got out of bed last you know early in the morning after maybe drinking the night before and he's come in and he's like this that and the other thing i'm not going to that school <laughs> but uh, 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 but i've also had an experience where the kid loves the school more than the person that probably founded the school yeah um so that like i think that's a good point the, the first impression the way they the way they speak about the school the way they show up you know, like I have one, I don't know if I tell you a story, but I have one kid, I said to him, I said, is this like a, is there like places to party on the weekends? Like, like, is this a party school? And he goes, well, the bus takes you down on the weekend and people go to the mall. And then, so you see the absolute horror of my, my daughter's <laughs> face. And then later I was like, wow. So people on the weekends, they go to the mall. She goes, dad, after you walked away, he came and said, no, it's the bars. <laughs> Clean it up for you a little bit. They're going to the mall. This is place. I like it. Yeah. And it's really interesting that that, um, that person often is just a student. I mean, they're just doing their college work study and yet it is an introduction to what's this campus going to do. You're, you're putting your business, you're putting your business in an entry level employee. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Million dollar employee. business. Right, that has not been probably really well trained, really well vetted, and you're literally taking your business, everything you've worked for, everything you talk about your with your senior leadership, and you're giving it to a kid, which right. is great if that kid deserves it. Right, <laughs> exactly. But you better be sure that they actually are going to represent really well, right? Um, so another really interesting thing about this sense of be belonging is academics versus real life so i'm reading a book called the privileged poor and for any of our participants who haven't read it i would really recommend it it is about students who get scholarships to go to really um, like harvard and how they experience equity in the classroom where they're able to be smart and they're showing up and they know what they're talking about and they so they have equity there but then spring break comes and all of their peers are going to Spain or they're taking a trip to go skiing for the entire week. And they're like, I, because the rest hall is closed, I'm going to be living out of my car and I don't have enough money for food. And so this clash of, I belong in the classroom, but I'm looking around and I'm like, who are these people? Again, the, the things that are stressing them out, I wish for the things that were stressing me out. What I'm dealing with is I don't have enough food or I don't have a place to stay or I'm feeling really overwhelmed with how much this is going to cost. And so that kind of juxtaposition. Listen, I have that dynamic with my twins. One is the, 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 I, you know, I, I, I don't have enough money for my sixth meal eating out and, you know, what, what kind of shoes am I going to wear? And my other daughter, who's 21, just graduated and is worried about medical insurance and paying her mortgage. And I'm like, you don't need medical insurance and you don't have a mortgage. What are you worried about? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that so interesting how, I mean, some of that is just your temperament. Like I am going to be responsible and a warrior, or I'm going to be carefree and just enjoy my life. Right. And, and until you have to worry. And then you, you're the opposite. And you're like, now you're panic. Yeah. That's right. It reminds, I was just, I took a trip. It's like the three little pigs, right? The pig who like saved the money and built the brick house. And then everybody else was like, whatever, we're going to go play. And then he's the stable one in the end because everybody right. can come live in, in his house. Um, the other thing I think as you're considering a sense of belonging is do students have external support? So the truth is the reason that I was successful in college is because we had family friends who lived in the town of Abilene who took me in and they became like my Abilene family and they had me over every Wednesday night for dinner 
and eventually invited me to move in with them. So I, I lived with them through college and that kind of external support where I don't really belong in the community of the school, but I do have a place where I can go where people understand me and they love me and they care for me and they're interested is huge. And a lot of our students who are in this equity gap and who are not um, persisting through to graduation, they don't have family support because their families don't understand what it takes to go to higher um, education, what it takes to graduate, what that looks like. And so not because they're bad parents, but just they don't have any context for what that means. Um, and that can really play with your sense of belonging when your family is saying, I mean, we had students who would try one semester and they maybe wouldn't get as good grades as they thought they wanted to. And their family would say, well, you tried, come home. Like you're done. You didn't do as well. Come home. All these examples, I have examples of my own family. Really? <laughs> yeah. Did that happen to you? No, but I, with my kids, it's like, you know, one of us is like, deal with it. And the other, the other one's like, all right, come home. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I bet you can't guess which one is which. <laughs> yeah. So that communication of like, well, I guess, I, I guess this isn't going to work out for you. Um, can be really difficult because then students feel kind of caught. They, they want to do what their family wants them to do, but then also, you know, they've decided to pursue this thing. And so that external support is really important and helping critical. students understand. And, and, and what I find is people that come from those circumstances, somehow, I, I'm sure there's plenty of people that get lost and drop out and go, go down the wrong path, but, but a lot of those people are also the people that, reinvented the world and are billionaires and dropped out of Harvard and, and dropped out of schools and said, you know what, I'm just going to go make my own way. Yeah. And again, when I was younger, I was desperate to figure it out. And the Air Force was my way out. But every part of my life until this day, I'm always like, it's like, I'm always in the figure out business. People say, you know, what, what are you an entrepreneur of? I said, figuring it out. I have a PhD in figuring it out. Yeah. And Anthony, what you're really good at um, not only doing, but also talking about is self-agency is this feeling that I, I am going to control my life and I'm going to decide. And I think if students, I mean, I, it doesn't matter to me if someone goes to college, if they don't want to go to college, that's fine. But I think, now, I think, I think now more than ever, it's going to be fine. Absolutely. I think you're exactly right. I think we talked about that last time where it's like, it's not for everybody. Go be a plumber or an electrician and you are going to make a lot of money and you're not going to have student debt. But you do have to have self-agency to say, I'm going to come up with a plan. I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do. These are the things that I'm going to pursue. And not everybody has that. And I, I find that people who have it, it baffles them that not everybody has it. They're like, I don't understand why you don't just... <laughs> Math like that too, where I'm like, I know that I understand that's your perspective. But for a lot of people, they're like, I, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. Right? right. And sometimes some people need a little, you know, kick in the butt and some people need a baseball bat to the butt. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it depends. I don't need any of that. I just need to leave me alone <laughs> and let me figure it out. Right. Matter of fact, it's funny, even like people like the guy I work out with, like if, if he was, if he pushed me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work out. Like, 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 don't push me. Just like show up and let's work out. Like if I need to sit for a second, I need to sit. Like don't rah rah me. Well, Matt's like that too. He mostly just says, do not boss me. You know? So I'm like, Hey, if we, and he's like, do not boss me. Do not. It's fine. Just let me be. I will get there, but do, I don't want you to tell me what to do. I'm good. I'm pretty self-directed. Right. <laughs> okay. So I have to tell you, first of all, I want to talk about your masterclass, but I have to tell you that the last webinar we did was everyone's favorite. They from said, the car. Wow, I got to go in the car. While you were in the car, they said um, that we, you and I did such a good job of articulating and breaking down what you do in Hotel Impossible. And we've been working together for almost a year. And you know, when I watch that show, I mean, it is a masterclass. We, we actually could teach a whole bunch of classes based on how you talk to people, how you manage problems, 
the things that you're saying about what the place looks like and what hospitality is. I mean, there's so many. I could go through every single episode. And we, you know, we did that. We had a, we had a, we had a, we had every Thursday. Me, and my partner. Yeah. Would do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, but but I think sometimes people get confused that it's just entertaining, which it is. I'm always entertained. But there's just this deeper level. And so I but think- you, I, I'm going to interrupt you because I want to give yeah. you a compliment because you, more than anybody I've ever met, you and this young woman, or this professor I work with, Suzanne, that we're dealing with something in Florida that I'll announce eventually about potentially doing a hospitality school. And uh, she also found a deeper meaning to what I do and kind of also can speak to it and like- the, the nuance of what I do. And like, yeah. again, I don't know the nuance of what I do because I just do it naturally. Right. Your, your ability to bring that out really, it, it not only inspires me, it's like, thank you. Thank you for realizing how much thought I put into everything we do. But again, it's not like I'm putting a lot of thought in. It's just my computer. I'm just are, doing yeah. it. But you, you appreciate it. And I appreciate you. Well, thank you. It is really fun for me to go through and see this really um, pretty intentional way that you just go through every single problem. So I wanted to do masterclass again, because everybody found it really helpful for us to articulate like, Hey, Anthony did this strategically. And this is how that, that plays out. So I want to show you, I want to talk specifically in this episode about language and about environment. So and just again, everybody, I have no idea what's coming out. Yeah, you don't, you don't. I like to surprise you. Okay. So um, Periwinkle, Kate May, a woman that really, really hated me and then started to like me at the end. That was a very good summary. <laughs> this is the Periwinkle Inn in the city of Cape May. This is the family. They've lived there forever. Um, she, I think her father bought this for her and she raised her kids. So this is in New Jersey. I have a lot to say about this family. Did you like my song that she made for me? I liked how you listened to it so enthusiastically. That was very kind of you. So the <laughs> daughter is a singer and she came up with a jingle that then she called Anthony into her office and played while he like politely paid attention to it. It was very kind. Were you like, get me out of here? You know what? I'd like to think I'm a kind of person in that, um, but I'm always kind of like that in life. It's because I'm uncomfortable. I'm an introvert, so right. I'm uncomfortable. So yeah. I probably was like a little bit get me out of here, but I'm a kind person. So yeah, you did. I, listen, somebody wrote a song for me. How many people yeah. write songs for you? You totally did attend and were very kind to her. So this is season two, episode seven. Um, you need to watch it. It's a great one. Here's their lobby. Oh boy. Oh boy. That would really even... work in the COVID world. Hey, I thought that. I thought they're looking back thinking, I wish I had my plexiglass back. <laughs> um, so there's a lot to be said. What I want to talk about in sense of belonging is, first of all, everything is broken, much like you did to this thing. So let me just show you a series of there's things. There's a backstory to this. So you kind of, keep going, was like this, which I know that you have a strategy, which is like, if it's broken, you have to fix it. No, I, I, this is a little bit more of a backstory. Okay, tell me. Do you want to hear it? Yes, please. All right, first of all, my designer, Casey Noble, um, is no longer a designer. She's now married to Clay Aiken. Uh, Clay, not Clay Aiken, Clay Matthews from the Green Bay Packers. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so I lost my one of my favorite designers. But anyway, yeah, great. I was taking it down. I didn't like it. I wanted it out. But I wanted to meet the owner first. It's res disrespectful to take somebody's front desk down without telling her what you're going to do or just saying, Hey, we're going to work. And just so you know, yeah. just, just so you know, we're going to do what we got to do. And that was her face. And the director said, just pull it down now. And I was like, I don't want to. And he's like, pull it down now. So I don't want to. And I was like, he's like, pull it down now. And I lost my temper. And he was like, come on, it's not a big deal. And I almost pulled it down because I was angry at him. <laughs> well, listen, Anthony, that's so thank you. Because when I watched this, I was like, that's out of That's character. Really out of character for him to pull it down and not tell her about it. And then she came back and was like, hey, I'm unhappy with you. And you're like, you're right. I'm sorry. Right. Because I he she because she was right. And I, I was very out of character for me and I was very uncomfortable. And um I just did it because um I got my anger out instead of beating the the the, the 
piss out of my director. <laughs> well, the analogy here is that everything is broken, which means that we're going to have this opportunity to change things. And so, but Absolutely. I appreciate that but, when but, I was like, that didn't seem like a thing Anthony would do. You're you know like, what? The not- analogy would be everything is I'm not changing what you're saying, yeah. but, but what I see this as an example of everything's got to change, but you have to change it in order. Right. Like I should have gotten in trouble with that young lady and get her mad at me. He wanted to do it. It's the only time I allowed a director to make me do something I didn't want to do. Yeah. And um, uh, I, in retrospect, it was good because it showed the audience that how I can capitulate so quickly and say, you're right, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Right. Especially when, like I said, like when I saw it, I was like, well, that was a strange thing to do. And then for you to come back so quickly and be like, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. I think was really helpful. But I do want to talk about policies and language because this hotel is crazy town. Scream at you. So first of all, policies, they only take cash, which this is your face when she told you that. You were like, you only take cash and traveler's checks, no credit cards, no debit cards, which means that for $200 a night, you're having to come in with $600. If you're going to spend three nights, you've got to carry $600 on you, right? So, and when you talk to her about it, she was like, but we've always done it this way, but it's expensive. They take some money. And you basically were like, hey, those are not good reasons. You are not serving your, the people who are coming. It's not a good excuse that you've always done it this way and that it's too expensive for you. Um, And I feel like that happens all the time in higher education and in hospitality, where we have these policies that are made for our comfort or our interests, and we're not thinking about how it affects our students or our clients. Can you say more about that? Well, look at it like Amazon. Why does Amazon work? What do you like them or you don't like them? Why do they work? Because it takes you eight seconds to order something. Right. Okay. So it's just, it's quick and it's easy and it's fast. And you don't really think, I don't really think, matter of fact, I was in a patio store and um, they have good Wi-Fi. They let you use their Wi-Fi. And I'm like, if I own this patio store, I wouldn't let anybody have Wi-Fi because what do I do? I went in, the, the, line, the, the guy wasn't very nice. And I went on Amazon, I went on Amazon, I walked out. So, so it's, it's, you got to make things easier, especially nowadays. It's got to be easy. It's got to be quick and it's got to be. And so it's great that you don't want to pay that extra commission. But so if you... If you pay no commission on a hundred dollars, but pay, uh, it's usually two point five percent credit card. Two point five percent on a hundred thousand dollars. What would you rather have, yeah. right? So you only have a limited amount of uh, income because you have because you're using cash. If you open it up, you're going to have unlimited amount of income, but you're going to pay two and a half percent. Right. It's like the mafia. It's that you're coming around and can knock on your door. You got a choice, close your business or, or, or work with the mafia. Yeah, that's right. And the we've always done it this way. I think what COVID allows us to do is to say, well, it's not going to be business as usual. Here is some punctuation where we can revisit what we've been doing and say, we're going to do it differently now because it makes more sense for students. Right. And go if you're going to use this moment for an excuse to save money because it worked during covid you're going to be in for a rude awakening yeah that is for sure in my opinion um the other thing i wanted to show you is that she's very bossy on her on her um hotel so i'm just going to show you a couple of pictures of all of the signs i know exactly what picture you're going to show me so i have i have a couple okay so first we have a yes you're open then we have a yelling at you for all the things and this is your face while you're yelling at me for all the things let me see (laughs) no dogs um she has a sign about don't use the ice and she has a sign about you can only park here and there's no children that was that was my favorite sign the one no children allowed in elevator without adult manage management again that makes sense but a fire sign doesn't make sense. That's a fire sign. That's red. It's like, you know, in order to ensure the safety of our families, we want we want to make sure that you're always accompanying a child under the age of 12. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. Like, But this is like, I'm going to spank your children if I see them. <laughs> well, you kept saying you don't have to yell. You can just tell them. 
And I think this is important with sense of belonging because I would not feel like I belong at this hotel. I would feel like this owner is angry at me and all I can do is do it wrong. And I don't understand the policies and I don't understand the rules and I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing. And if you think about a student, <laughs> yelling the sign. If you think about a student on a campus where their language is shaming and angry and yelling, and you better pay your bill and you better pick a major and you owe us money and you can't do that and your syllabus, like all of that language, the only thing it does is make me feel like I don't wanna be here. I, I can only be wrong. I can only fail. In fact, there was a study um, that just came out which is about how the language of a syllabus has an impact on students. And they did this study where they had a syllabus that had like rationale for assignments and positive language and sharing of personal experiences and all of this like, hey, I'm a real person and I wanna be somebody who's gonna help you. And then they had a control group that had just kind of a mad syllabus. And what happened was the, the people who had the warm syllabus, all of those students were more likely to ask for help with class assignments, more likely to ask for help when they were feeling overwhelmed to ask about campus resources and to ask the teacher to help them with um, specific homeworks or like uh, um, test prep. And so this idea that we're just yelling and telling everybody you have to do this thing nobody feels welcomed. And that's true in higher ed and in hospitality. hundred percent. Right. And, and with the way you raise your children. Right. Exactly. So this is another one where she's like, your balance is due in full and you cannot traveler's checks. And, and their excuse is like, if you don't do that, they won't do what we want, which is not hospitable. It is not welcoming and giving people a sense that they belong with you. It's actually just, I, I think the right way to think about that is in terms of um, trust. So this woman was distrustful. She wanted to make sure everybody did what she wanted and she was afraid that it was gonna fall apart. And you were like, hey, you can still have rules and you can still have policies. You just don't have to be still mad about it all the time. Right, because, you know, and, and that's true in hospitality, and I'm sure it's true in all businesses, including how you add, it's, you got to get over, like, it's like we said before, traveling, right? Just get over, there's going to be delays, there's going to be problems, just get over it. Like, before yeah. you get there, get over it. If you get in the hotel business, get over that people are going to take your pool towel home. Get over the fact that somebody's going to take your white towel and use it for their shoes. You know, get over that somebody's going to break your lamp. You yeah. got to just build that into your business and get over it. Because if you don't get over that, you're not going to be able to run your business. And I would imagine the same thing in high ed. Get over the things that are just in eight in your business. Right. That's right. And I think when she says to her, to her clientele, I don't trust you, they hear it. And they're like, I don't trust you either. I don't want to be around you, which is true in higher education. If you have students who are first generation or don't know their major or lower socioeconomic level and what they're constantly hearing is, I don't trust you. You're in trouble. You're going to get it wrong. They're like, I hear you. And I don't really want to be around you because that's not a place that I feel like welcomes me or is going to help me be successful. You're just mad all the time. Um, so you said this in the show, and I think it's exactly right. It's true about hospitality and higher education too. Every single person is important. And if you bring them into your school, you have to figure out a way to give them that sense of belonging because it's integral to the way that they're going to be able to be successful and go through and graduate. You, 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 heard, it, you heard it on my show today with the ambassador. He was a narcissist that was demanding and he realized I got to change my thinking. Yeah, that's right. In fact, you said that here, you got to recalibrate your thinking the way you have been thinking about it is five years in the red and you're not going to be successful unless you fix what it is that you've been thinking. So I think that's exactly right. So just two more things about this show, which I just think are entertaining. So um, I don't know why you're reacting this way. I think it's because, I don't know. Um, but here- Oh, the ice machine. It's the ice machine. Here, you are like, hey, we could just solve your ice problem, take down your sign and get another ice maker. And I like how everyone's always shocked when you solve the problem so simply, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, we could have just gotten another ice maker. And that, and that scene or around that scene, right before, right after that scene, I can't remember exactly. 
Um, we, we something happened on the show that I won't really talk about here, but, and we didn't talk about it in the show, but um, somebody on the show had an absolute, um, very scary moment, just an oh, absolute wow. break, breakdown. Um, like I thought I was gonna have to call an ambulance. It got real bad. It got real ugly. Oh, Matter of fact, I, 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 I refused to film anymore until I had a guarantee. Um, it was the young lady. It was the it was the daughter. Uh, until I had a guarantee from the mother that it was okay to film because I felt the pressure of the show and and me yeah. were just too much for her. And I was just like, um, I don't want to do the show anymore. I'm done. And I I co I told the producers, I like, called Travel Channel. I was like, I'm walking off the show. Um, th this young lady might be in danger and I'm not going to be responsible um, for pushing her over the edge. So yeah. I'm done. I'm done. And then the mother, the daughter and the son came to me and said, no, 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 we're good. I said, okay. But I just need that. I just need to have that. We, I think we had it on video and we just saved it yeah. um, because I'm scared. Like I'm nervous. And I'll be honest with you, I backed down a little bit after that because she was very fragile. Yeah. She, she, it was obvious that she was not used to critique of herself and that it was very um, distressing for her. Even, even mild critique of her, right, was very distressing. Um, okay, well, let me show you the end of the show. So first of all, you solved the towel problem, which I can't even, I honestly, so the summary is they didn't have pool towels. They had to use their, uh, their, room towels and then they had to hang they had to walk across the parking lot to hang them on these lines and then who knows what towel you get to go whatever it was such a disaster that's one of those things where I'm like I cannot believe that they lived with that for however long they did and you're like um how about if we get some new tool new pool towels and they're yellow and then we've solved that problem too. right and you know what's, what's interesting is people like Anthony like some of the like problems you solve are like they're so simple I was like listen I like I run complicated hotels. What I do for a living is complicated. It's been 35 years and I'm still learning and I still get scared of like, wow, do I know the answer here? So running hotels are very complicated. Unfortunately, or fortunately on this show, Hotel Impossible, um, most of the problems are pretty simple. <laughs> Like I can fix that for you. Watch, right? Watch yellow. So I do, I do love that in terms of people get paralyzed and they feel stuck and they don't know what to do. And they need somebody to be like, or we could just get another ice maker, or we could just get some other towels. And then somehow that kind of unlocks their brain to say, oh, we can do things in a new way. Oh, we can come well, up with solutions. Well, well I, I, I always talk about it, as we may have talked about before, is when you're a little baby, right? You drop the spoon, you're in the high chair, you drop the spoon on the floor. Oh, put the spoon back. Drop the spoon on the floor. Put the spoon back. By the fifth time, maybe you smack the little the baby's hand like, oh, don't do that. Yeah. Then you go to school, sit there. Then you're on a baseball team. You follow these rules. So we are so just, just okay. trained yeah. to follow rules, sit there, don't sit there. So the time you're in a position of being an entrepreneur, what I say is you have to preneur. If you're an entrepreneur, you got to preneur. <laughs> and and, and, and we, we just, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, there are no rules. Right. And, and but we are so it just focused. It makes people so nervous. That makes people so nervous. But, 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 but there's a reason for it because there's been rules. It's like we've talked about before. You go to school, no rules because there's no parents and you, you these kids lose their minds. You're like, why right. do they lose their mind? Because they went from jail to complete freedom. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they need, there's like somewhere in there is a guide to say, hey, I'm going to help you figure this out. But that's right. People who can make their own decisions, I think, are few and far between. And also, it makes other people. Very and, I think, and, and I think from college, colleges and universities, it's like they're going from a maximum security prison in most families. Yeah. Meaning you're fully secure to complete freedom, whereas maybe you need a minimum security right. prison before you let them go. <laughs> Right. That's what and, RAs and, 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 and that's do. what's making them feel supported. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I'll show the last couple of pictures just so we can have a summary on this. But I would just say in terms of how you address what's going on on your campus, this is the before bed. Oh, you don't like that? Oh, God. you don't feel like you just want to crawl up in there and go to the bed? I have no you, sense of belonging. <laughs> you say you say you want to go to sleep. Listen, oh. this is this is that was the minimum security prison. That's like, oh, look at that, huh? She's, she's does job. such a great job in such a small space. Yeah. And then she did the, um, this, this also, which she did a great job. 
So yeah, which is very, very, it wasn't my favorite lobby design that she's done, but it was period specific. Yeah, she did a great job. So it's a great episode to watch. Oh, and then you got to be friends with her and you jumped in the pool. Yeah, I was like, I was like, you hated me and I hated you. You like me now? She goes, yeah, let's jump in the pool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is a good, I mean, that's a great outcome, Anthony. There are not many people who can start with somebody who hates them and end up like, hey, that, I'm on your side. That's almost every show we do. I mean, yeah. almost every show we do. And it's not, it's not scripted. I had a hundred dollar bet with the directors. The director's like, there's no way in hell that woman's jumping in the pool with you. I was like, she's going to jump in the pool with me. <laughs> and he goes, there's no way in one hundred dollars. Like, she jumped in. The, she asked me, she goes, let's jump in the pool. Okay. Yeah. So, so you know, because the, the one thing that whether you're a university, whether you're a business, whether it's a family, when you look in the eyes of someone and tell them the truth, like I got her when I said, I'm sorry, you're right, I'm wrong. Yeah. That laid the foundation. For okay, well, maybe this guy is okay. And well, then Anthony, because she was distrustful. And when you did that, you said, You don't have to be afraid, you can trust me, right? And that's the place where she was like, Oh, okay, he is trustworthy, right? Right. right. And yeah. I had to prove it. But 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 I didn't prove it by walking in and ripping her, her desk apart. And again, right. you you nailed it's so funny because you had that thing. It's like that's not Anthony's personality. And it wasn't. I did it out of frustration. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been an hour. Really? We've been talking for an hour. Yeah. yeah well, you did um, most of the talking, which I like. I <laughs> well, learned. Every, I learned. I learned something every time I I I do one of these. I just have well, some good. Time. We love when you come to spend time with us. We're going to be talking next week about shock factors and about how they really affect a sense of belonging oh. for a student. Things like bad grades. You said loss of financial aid. I saw that. I was like, you said shock. I looked at. I was like, oh. Those are all things that for a student who knows um, who they are and that they belong in a place, they can, they can kind of roll with the punches. But if you already are like, I don't know if I belong here or not, and any of those things happen, you're like, this is a disaster. I have to go. So we'll talk next week about controlling that narrative. But I would just say this sense of belonging, which, like I said, this is an introduction and we're going to be talking about it over the next couple of weeks. I think it's really important to start experiencing your campus through students who are questioning whether or not they belong in your space, whether or not they've made a good choice, whether or not they're valued, invited in to be part of your community, um, and really talking to students about those experiences because there are subtle little things that are done on a campus that we totally miss that when you ask a student, they're like, I felt like I didn't belong when this thing happened and you're hard pressed to notice those things if you are not being super intentional about your language. And every, your environment. every president of every university should do undercover boss on their university. I agree. That would be such a fun show. Let's do it. Let's do it. That would be awesome. I would love it. Okay. So resources for you guys, as always, Art of Community, a great book, Kintsugi. Um, that's our theme for the year. So we'll be talking more about that. Cap and gown every Tuesday at two. Anthony will be joining me for Mission First on some of those. And then also we're having our professional development conference in May. Um, we'd love for you guys to join us there. We're talking about bridging the gap between academics and student development. And so I am just so excited that we are at the place that we're at um, in the world and that we can start thinking about things like Summit Initiative to help close the equity gap, that we can think about doing some traveling. Matt and I have a couple of trips to schools that are coming up and I'm going to Santa Fe this week. Oh, great. I'm just happy to be going a place. I told my daughter it's her spring break, and I was like, "We gotta go somewhere. We gotta make some memories." So, yeah, well, I'm the same way right now with my family. It's like I don't care where we're going. So, there's yeah. a couple of trips I got planned. Some my wife coming, some she's not because she's like, "I don't want to go that far." Okay. Yeah. She says, no, but I'm gonna go and tell. I'm gonna tell the kids we're gonna go. And I said, like, "Hey, we're going." You and then tell? she'll be like, "I guess I'll come. I don't want." No, to she'll be her. like, "See." You. <laughs> Some peace and quiet. Finally. One of the things you have to know about my wife, my wife does nothing she doesn't want to do. Yeah, that seems right. That seems about right. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. It's always good thank to spend time with you. And always a pleasure. I think we're back in our regular schedule. So I will talk to you in a couple of weeks. 
And would you like to end with your tagline? Be kind to yourself.